Um, thanks for coming along. Um, my name is Shirin. I work at People's History Museum here. This is the country's museum for democracy and it's based here in Manchester. Um, so today is the last day of the Heritage Open Day uh, 2019. It's England's largest festival of history and culture and it brings over 2,000 organisations together. It has 40,000 volunteers each year for one week in September every year. Um, places across the country throw open their doors, so here today, um, to celebrate their heritage and the community and, and history. So it's a really great chance to kind of see hidden places and to try new experiences like what we've been doing today with the workshop, and, and it's free. Um, so this year's theme is, is people power. Um, and each year an artist commissioned um, um, for the Unsung Stories project and it's supported by the uh, People's Postcode Lottery. So thank you very much to all the players of the People's Postcode Lottery. Um, and so this year Sarah Corbett was asked to be the artist and has created the Dare to Dream Craftivism project. Um, and it's delivered in the, the communities to connect to local histories of change makers of the, of the past um, who had a dream that they worked towards, um, kind of trying to make that a reality, um, and how that has shaped our present day um, for future struggles, for kind of a future uh, struggles for, for change, really. So Sarah's here with us today, and um, she's delivered these five craftivism workshops across the country. Um, and this is the last one today that we've just all been, most, a lot of us have been part of today um, for this Dare to Dream event. So we're really lucky to have Sarah Corbett here today um, at the museum. Uh, Sarah, for people who don't know, Sarah is an award-winning activist, an author, an Ashoka Fellow, a founder of the Global Craftivist Collective. Um, she grew up in a low-income area of the UK. Uh, she was part of an activist family. Um, and she's worked as a professional campaigner for over a decade, and most recently with Oxfam GB. Um, she started doing craftivism, which is kind of craft and activism, um, in 2008 to add a different tool to activism um, into, uh, as a kind of toolkit, really. Um, it's a form of slow, quiet, and intimate and effective activism, and she calls this gentle protest, and we're going to hear a bit more about that in a minute. Um, so due to demand, Sarah set up the award-winning Craftivist Collective in, in 2009, um, producing products and services for individuals, groups, organisations to be effective craftivists using this unique methodology. Um, so Sarah's work has helped to change government laws, business policies, as well as hearts and minds through her unique gentle protest methodology. And she works across different kind of mediums, really. But first and first, foremost, I think she'd say she's an activist. Um, so Sarah's going to be in conversation with me today. Um, I work here at the museum. I'm a researcher. And I'm also a historian based at um, Manchester Metropolitan University. So we're really lucky to have, have, have you here, Sarah, today. Thank you very much for coming along. And I guess, first of all, I was interested maybe in thinking about what or just an open question of uh, what does craftivism mean to people who might not be um, used to the term? And maybe if you could talk a bit more about the Open Heritage Days and activities. Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks for doing this with me, Sharon, as oh, well. It's great and to have it's you. a pleasure to be in conversation with you about the history of protest in the past and what we think it might look like in the future as well. It's a nice, juicy topic, I think. We're all keen to learn more about. Um, so I always say, when people say, what's craftivism? I always say it's a little bit like when you think of punk music. If you think of punk music, you've got all these different bands. They sound very different, but they're put under that umbrella. Um, and craftivism's the same. So it was a word coined in 2003 by an American woman called Betsy Greer, actually while she was living in London. And she's a knitter, and she noticed that knitting with other, mostly women, she saw as a very political um, act to do, very personal, but also talking about make, do, and mend, and consumerism. Um, so she coined this word craftivism. And I came to craftivism in 2008, so 11 years ago now, which sounds surreal to say out loud. Um, because I was a burnt out activist and I picked up a cross stitch kit to go on a train to Glasgow because I missed using my hands and I knew I couldn't paint on the train even though I like to paint um, and not thinking at all that I would mix the two but there was lots of elements that we'll talk 
throughout this evening about elements of craft where I think it works for activism. So like any millennial, I'm a millennial by a month, but I like to claim <laughs> the youth as much as I can. Um, I Googled craft and activism and this word existed. Yeah. And Betsy's so good at saying anyone can use the word, you do use it however you want. So if you Google craftivism, you'll see lots of different forms from knitting around lampposts to quilts to crochet, some fundraising, some donation, some activism, some more awareness raising. It's it's like punk. That's how I like to see it. Yeah, sounds great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe if you wanted to talk a bit about the Heritage Open yeah. Days. Yeah. Through. Yeah. So so this is the last day of Heritage Open Days. It happens every year. Um, and as you just heard, thousands of people get involved and thousands of organisers. And every year they commission an artist um, to do a project. And I got an email. Um, and one, I don't see myself as an artist, so I nearly put it in the in the the bin. And luckily my best friend who is an artist was staying with me and I said, oh, this sounds cool, but I think they probably got the wrong person. Um, and I had a meeting with Heritage Open Days who said their theme is people power. They really want to show how people power doesn't always have to mean standing on a soapbox or lots of people. And that's really important and I'm not um, dismissing that at all, but they wanted to show other forms of protest. And I didn't realize that the two directors, two women, had come to one of my lectures before who were in the audience and they said we went along and we think you could do something and it's the first time we've done a project they've done a project where it's not just separate few events normally the commissioned artist does one to three events like, sort of on their own as part of heritage open days and this time they said could you create something that the organizers could do as well so we've done six events um from totnes um in dartington hall to durham here in manchester and Norwich we've done two at some of um, some places and one at others and then we've had 27 local organizers more actually some are using our kits that you got today and some are just using all the resources and all of the resources are free online to be used by organizers for how forever however long this this fragile earth lasts they can use the resources to do every year um, and the reason I came up with dare to dream was especially I'm sure a lot of you will resonate with this the last 10 years when you say I'm an activist often people sort of might get scared and close off a little bit and think it's a certain type of thing and at the early days I was getting people who loved craft saying I want to join in your craftivism or burnt out activists saying I'm completely burnt out is this a new way I can be sustainable or people who are quite anxious saying I'm scared of other forms of extrovert protest but can I join in and the last couple of years the requests have been more and more of people saying, I don't just want to be an activist, I have to do activism. Like we're living in a world that feels on the cusp of, you know, this real urgent time. But then so much of the activism we see is no to this, no to that, we don't want this, we don't want that. And I base so much of my work on neuroscience and psychology, and I know that the more we say we don't want this, we don't want that, all we think of is that thing we don't want. And that puts us in a state of despair rather than an in empowering act of what do I want? And you look throughout history of change makers and how they've sustained what they do and mobilized people. And you know, there's, it's, um, there's no coincidence that it's about dream. And, and I, in my book, I talk about how Martin Luther King had a dream, not a complaint. That's what kept him going and what mobilized people. And I felt like, in activism when I got the email in December and we were chatting in January I said there's a real lack of dreaming in a lot of our activism and we have to have a dream of what we want in the world for our brains to physically be able to come up with solutions otherwise we just go into fight flight or freeze mode and we can't actually think our prefrontal cortex doesn't work while we're in despair so we agreed on this dare to dream where we focus on what's the societal dream we want is it very local is it global and how can we be part of making that dream happen and how can we help other people be part of the dream which is much more positive and solution focused than world worrying or creating divisions so that was the plan and so far it's worked yeah, quite well I think good. you can ask all of our craftivists sitting yeah. around yeah. if it worked for them yeah that sounds brilliant yeah yeah I mean shall I talk a bit about some of the kind of uh, change makers in, in our museum. Yeah, so and part of what I love about Heritage Open Days is we're learning from history. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at his 
history from the past of what we can learn from them even though it's in a different context mm -hmm. and then how we can use some of that learning for the future yeah. so for heritage open days here we've been looking at the matchstick girls in other cities we've been looking at lots of other local change makers who've, who've either reached their dream or worked towards it so my this is an in conversation so my question for you is mm -hmm. can you tell us a bit more about the matchstick girls story and then also any any others you want to mention here to help us think about not just their story but to pick out some of those strategies and tactics of what they use to, to make real change yeah sure so in, in our museum i don't know if people have had a chance to look in the permanent gallery so we celebrate the match girls as a kind of key strike which changed the role of women within the within the working class and within the trade union movement uh, so they were kind of written off as very unskilled laborers they were migrant women they were from irish backgrounds they were seen as some of the kind of poorest women in the east end of london and, and they organized in quite inspiring ways really to, to to win demands demands for a lunch break demands for better pay uh, and it shocked the trade union movement at the time. It was a kind of a movement that didn't see unskilled, what, what is described as unskilled laborers uh, as part of the trade union movement. Um, and so they organized in really imaginative ways. They pulled in different groups from the community. They were often married to dockers in the East End. Um, and they were inspired by Annie Besson, who had gone in as a journalist and had reported on their conditions. So that's one of the kind of um, strikes we celebrate within our, within our galleries. And, and we look back, that was in 1880. 88, so it was a kind of key moment, we think, in kind of that change um, in that longer struggle for democracy, really. And we call them girls because on average they were teenagers who were doing really difficult work, really awful conditions within the factory. They would get a horrible cancer called uh, fossy jaw from using the white phosphorus that made the matches. But it's just one struggle, really, that we, we celebrate within our, within our galleries as a way of thinking through those maybe excluded people in, in British history who were seen as too, too unskilled, too, too, too womanly, too, um, too much from migrant backgrounds to really organize. And they, they proved the complete opposite. That actually, they were some of the, the most um, inspiring and, and, and successful activists, really, in that period. So that, that's one moment in history that we celebrate in, in our galleries. I also was thinking around connecting it to kind of craftivism a bit. And, and so this year, people in, in Manchester is the 200th anniversary of the Peterloo massacre that took place. And I don't know if people had time to see our, our temporary exhibition on, on that massacre. And actually, what's striking to me is actually how much creativity there was within the democracy movement in 1819. So this was a movement calling for universal suffrage. Um, a, a, move, a mass movement that had witnessed a really horrific massacre in Manchester, and yet the creativity in response to that massacre is really impressive and quite inspiring again. So in our exhibitions you can see handkerchiefs that people made to remember the massacre. Seems like quite a weird thing now to, to make a handkerchief of a massacre, but this was a way of keeping the memory alive of that massacre when the British government were trying to repress any memory really of, of that massacre glass paintings to, to remind people of the massacre, really beautiful, striking images, but ways or the ordinary people kept a memory of a massacre going. We wouldn't know about that massacre 200 years later um, if it hadn't been for ordinary people kind of making those beautiful objects and different forms of craft, really, that have continued that memory. So there's some of the kind of campaigns, really, that, 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 that we, we talk about and we share within our galleries to celebrate that longer history of, of democracy, I guess, and and within the I mean within the democracy movement during the eighteen like the beginning of the eighteen hundreds, there were amazing women who led that movement. The most powerful of which was Mary Fowles. So she was the leader of the women's reform organisation. She was pregnant at the five months pregnant at the time of the massacre, leading the demonstration on the stage. And she didn't back down at all. The, the uh, yeomanry had tried to kill her on the day. And she continued to organize for contraception. She had a large number of children. So she organized within kind of working class communities. Um, um, she threw herself into the Chartist movement in the 1830s and 40s. So she was another kind of working class woman who didn't give up at all. And, and someone, again, who we, we celebrate within, within our galleries. So there's some of the kind of struggles that we, we talk about. I mean, I was guess. I'm quite new to craftivism as a, as a movement and a, a, as a kind of form of practice. Um, 
and it made me think about the arts and crafts movement. And, and within, our move, um, within our museum, we, we celebrate William Morris in our archives. So people are welcome to come and have a look at our archives. And we've got a lot of kind of different letters and poetry from William Morris. And to me, he seemed like quite an inspiring man, someone who kind of pushed the ideas of the arts and crafts movement. He completely was hor hor horrified by kind of the industrial revolution, he called it the kind of ugliness of the industrial revolution and the meanness of capitalism really. He, he hated that world and he at points looked back to the past, he was kind of a romanticist in some ways and he kind of um, rejected that, that what, how he was living at the time. Um, and he made these beautiful, what's, beautiful kind of wallpaper and things he's very well known for. Um, but he also didn't want that to be just for the rich at all. He wanted it to be for ordinary people, these, these beautiful things. I mean, some of his ideas now seem quite relevant to today. He was kind of an early environmentalist. He talked about how the Industrial Revolution was killing the planet. Um, um, but he also kind of really believed in changing the world for in, in the future as well and creating things for ordinary people. I mean, some of his, uh, some of his things now, it reminds me a little bit of Mary Kondo. So one of his favorite quotes was, um, have nothing in your house that you do not know, need, uh, that you do not know to be useful or believe to be beautiful. I think, has, Mary, has some of these movements kind of looked back to William Morris? But he was also a socialist as well. He was an activist in his own right. Um, so for me, he's hugely inspiring. And I wondered what the links were with this new craftivist movement and, and the previous kind of arts and crafts movement of the past. Yeah. Um, I mean, I can only talk for Craftivist Collective and my craftivism I do, but mm -hmm. I know, like, I've always loved William Morris's Everything Should Be Useful and Beautiful, yeah. and I remember in Liverpool, where I'm from, we have a radical bookshop that always sells the best postcards with the best quotes oh, yeah. on, and I had a quote, that quote on, um, and my dad's a bit of a hoarder, so <gasps> I used to put it in front of him and be like, is it useful or beautiful? <laughs> but all of his books, apparently, were very useful. Um, so I've always had a bit of, known a bit about William Morris, but not actually that much and I would like to spend more time knowing a bit more about John Ruskin yeah. and, and that movement in general. For me, my journey into craftivism was very much as an activist, seeing the flaws in a lot of activism and then seeing where craft could help and strengthen some tools in the toolkit and I never looked at history so I'd get especially in the early days people would say oh so you must know a lot about Morris and Ruskin and I'd say nope. I know the general gist, but I don't know that much because I was always making it relevant to the context we're in. And I'm not a historian. I'm very jealous of people who, who get to do that. So for me, 11 years ago, it was, uh, it was I've been an activist since, my mum says, since I was in the womb in West Everton in Liverpool. Um, my dad's the local vicar. My mum's now a politician, was a nurse and a full-time mum. And I was squatting in social housing at the age of three with my little beaker with the rest of our community to save the, the social housing from demolition. And we campaigned on local issues as well as global issues like South Africa apartheid movement. We were part of that. And I went to South Africa when I was eight as my dad's only ever sabbatical that he took he's a bit of a workaholic um, so I grew up very much surrounded by posters of Martin Luther King and Lenin about Desmond Tutu and Mandela and seeing inequality firsthand so we were always campaigning and we'd often lose a lot of campaigns because you do because activism's hard work and it doesn't always win but we always in the back kitchen people would be swearing like troopers saying, oh, we targeted this person and we should have targeted the housing officer, not the housing association, or we should have been doing this on health and that person told us they had the power, but they don't have the power. So I sort of was soaking all that up and ended up campaigning at school and at university and then um, being a professional campaigner because I think it's the only job I probably could have ever got. And I noticed all these flaws. I noticed that as an activist in my personal life, as an introvert, I like to reflect a lot. I like to do quiet stuff. And everything was very performative, loud, sometimes quite ego-driven, which I think can discredit campaigns if people think, do you really care about the cause or do you just like standing on a stage? Um, you know, we've got to be careful about that. And all of the petitions I was doing for big charities, the focus was, we need as many signatures as possible. Please go to that festival and get as many petitions signed as possible. And I understood that. But I also thought, well, we're campa campaigning on climate change for the first time ever. Most people haven't even heard the phrase before. 
we're asking them to sign a petition, but we're not explaining what climate change is. We're not explaining how if you sign this petition, it helps change this law, but also we need to look at holistically of what we can do as consumers, as constituents. As I felt like we were treating people as robots with the clicktivism and the slacktivism. And I also was very aware, especially as my mum is a politician and working with or, or challenging a lot of politicians, I hate, I still really hate how people demonize them and throw milkshakes at them and it makes no logical sense because we just close off if someone attacks us even if we we agree with them we don't actually listen and i thought that you know to make real long-term change we can still be loud and we can still do performances for media but we don't need to be hateful and divisive so the craft for me was less about bring you know taking on the baton of the past ages of political craft it was me just going oh my word people are asking me what i'm stitching on a train no one asks no one talks to strangers on trains especially in britain <laughs> most of the time and people were asking me what i was stitching i thought oh if i'm stitching if i was stitching a quote by gandhi we could have a chat about it if i was stitching this and then because of the aesthetics it does remind you of your grandparents your grandmothers um, very soft power, so naturally people are intrigued by it. Um, it's non-threatening, it's more gentle. So it was the process and the aesthetics that, for me, just made sense of slowing down to use the craft to think more critically, using the object to attract people in rather than force it in people's face. So I didn't really think about William Morris, if I'm honest. <laughs> now I do a little bit, but I don't, I don't um, look... I don't spend time in libraries reading about it. That I look much more of how can we use Instagram better? How can we use Pinterest? How can we yeah. have those one-to-one -one conversations in beautiful rooms like this? Yeah, that, that makes answer sense. The question? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I want to ask you, Sharon, mm. about outreach. Mm. So we live in such a digital world yeah. now. A lot of our outreach is online. Mm. And I think, you know, I wouldn't be sitting on this stage talking to you without our amazing online community. And a lot of our volunteers, actually, we connected online and then met each other in real life. Yeah. So I think that's really amazing. But sometimes I worry that our default is just we'll talk to people online. And sometimes we actually forget how to have real conversations especially with people we disagree with can you give us a few examples of from you as a historian where has outreach again tactics been used really well that we can learn from that's relevant today yeah. I mean one example that comes to mind in our galleries we talk about the Grunwick strike which started in yeah. in 1976 and that was um, a workplace of Asian women um, who walked out in support of, who wanted a trade union, who wanted better conditions, and they were completely isolated in their factory in North London. And I guess the strike forced them to go and make new connections with people. So they had to speak to the postal workers, they had to speak to different people in different unions, and it created completely different networks that had never existed before. These were very isolated Asian women who, who were migrants actually from East Africa. And it created yeah, networks of solidarity, I guess, that hadn't existed previously in the area. It's kind of, it was a failed strike, actually. It lasted two years, and so in some ways it's quite weird that it's celebrated in some ways in our galleries and more nationally. Um, but it transformed, I guess, the role of Asian women within the trade union movement in, in the 70s. There have been a number of strikes in the 70s of, the, of Asian and black workers um, which hadn't got the support of the trade union movement quite similar to the match girl strike actually but this is a whole century later um and it forced it because of the kind of tenacity and the courage of those women going into workplaces where they would never have known anyone and kind of forcing them to they, they're creating these new networks of, of, of solidarity it, it transformed i guess the the role of asian women in the british labor movement and so for that reason we we celebrate it in our galleries but those kind of creative networks actually so people going and making banners together in, in the in in different workplaces or getting to know people they would have socials and um, we've got some beautiful banners that were made 
collectively by the strikers um, and, it, and Brent, Brent trained council who supported them. So those networks of solidarity are really important to continuing a, a, a campaign, I guess, and, and that's why we celebrate the Grunwick strike in our gallery. So that was one where, obviously, the internet didn't exist at all in that period, and, and yet they, were, they, they found different ways of connecting to different people in, in, in the area. And it became a kind of core celeb, a kind of national uh, media story in, in Britain, and, and one that we kind of celebrate, I guess. Um, so that was one kind of outreach success, in some ways successful, in some ways fa failed strike um, in, in Britain. I mean, Sarah, you, you use activism, I mean, your kind of craftivism to kind of reach new audiences. I've seen your TED Talks that have got kind of hundreds of thousands, even a million views, I think. Um, so how do you think about connecting to new audiences? And what, what are your strategies for, for doing that? Yeah, I mean, I'd like to say I had a strategy from day one yeah. on outreach. I totally didn't. I sort of felt that craft and activism could work well together, mm -hmm. but always making sure that I didn't shoehorn craft into activism where it wasn't relevant. Mm -hmm. That's why I talk about it as one tool in the toolkit. Um, and I started doing it on my own. And as an introvert, if there's any introverts in the room, we love being on our own. A few hands up, I like that. Um, so I started a blog about my craftivism only because my friends and family were asked and because I worked in the NGO world in the UK which is quite small lots of people were saying I've heard that you're doing this weird thing with cross stitch and I said yeah and I you know I wanted to just do it on my own um, and I get bored of hearing my own voice so I'd better asking questions um, so I just thought I'll do this blog and then I'll tell people when people ask I'm like read the blog forgetting actually that a blog is for the whole wide world yeah. and I started it in October 2008 and by December I had people all over the world asking to join in and lots of burnt out activists, lots of people nervous of activism, lots of craft lovers um, from Australia and America mostly, which was strange. So it all happened very organically. Um, and I set up the group because there was a few in London and I live in East London and there was a few f strangers and friends who wanted to join. So 10 of us met in the, in the British Library in the cafe over a cup of tea and said, okay, let's come up with a name. Uh, so we came up with the Craftivist Collective. And then over the years, what I was shocked by, but I guess in retrospect, everything makes more sense, doesn't it? So within the first few months, we were doing different projects, and most of them were crap, you know, not very, like, you, le you learn through mistakes, don't you? So I was honing my craft in craftivism. But I ended up having um, the Haywood Gallery ask me to do a craftivism event for their Tracy Emin exhibition, and they had this rooftop area that they wanted lots of big events to happen and they weren't getting big numbers and I was like well I don't know if we will or not but you know we'll try it out and this seems like a good fit um, for people to do their stitching and think about loving society whereas Tracy Emin's exhibition was about singular love um, and we had 70 people on the roof and the Haywood were like this is unusual I was like well this is interesting and then the South Bank wanted us to do events we had people joining the craftivists where we'd have over 100 people come along so without me promoting it it sort of really captured people and as someone who naturally is quite shy and gets quite anxious you attract I think when people see that you're a bit anxious, often it puts them at ease if they're anxious. Yeah. So I attract that type of audience um, who might not be good at, my sister's quite an extreme confident extrovert. So she's an amazing activist in ways that I can't be and attracts that audience. Um, so it, it definitely tapped a, an area that a lot of forms of activism weren't offering of somewhere to sit quietly on your own or stitch with other people and um, take part in your room without anyone knowing and share stuff online so it all happened by accident and now obviously I try and really focus on those strengths so I work a lot with women's institutes and there's a few here that I love because I know that's a really influential audience with politicians and also there's that craft connection but I also my TED I did a TEDx talk called activism needs introverts that is now on the TED website and had over a million hits and that's made people say oh my it's made a lot of people actually say oh this is really annoying because now I have no excuse not to do activism now that you've said that introverts are good <laughs> activists we're in different ways mm -hmm. so I really focus on those audiences that might be scared of other forms of activism and one example is with the climate coalition in the UK which is hundreds of 
charities and campaign organizations getting people to march on climate change asked me to do a project to bring people to climate marches who might never have gone on a march before so we did these green hearts you wear on your sleeve saying what you love and how you want to protect it from the climate um crisis that we're in and what was amazing is we had 500 people in one room a bit like this stitching away who many had never gone on a march before and because they'd spent time stitching their heart and they'd listened to what the march will look like how important the march is as well as other actions to take they had the confidence to say okay i'm gonna go on the march because i'm gonna wear my heart on my sleeve that i've spent hours making and i haven't got an easy excuse to say no and i went with a lot of people who'd never been on a march before to the London um, climate march a few years ago and it was people who were very anxious and scared of loud noises and you know of the scary idea you have of protest marches and as soon as they saw other people because the climate coalition it was a national campaign so we had lots of different groups make hearts as well as soon as people saw people's homemade hearts on their sleeves you know across a crowded um row it really put people at ease and they felt much more that they were protesters with other people rather than those protesters are those loud people and we're the quiet people and i think that had ripple effects online as well as offline and it it reached people who said oh well i can make this thing and maybe i could go or if i physically um can't leave my home i can make my heart for someone else to go so on the climate strikes on friday we had some people who can't leave their homes for whatever reason who made the most beautiful banners for different organizations to say i'm with you on your march because i've made you this and they were stunning and i saw pictures of them on the march so that outreach is so varied but it's focusing on where there's a gap rather than preaching to the converted yeah. or just offering something that people don't need to to take them on that bridge to activism it's reaching new audiences i'm rambling no, that sounds Cut amazing yeah, that sounds point. brilliant no, it sounds really brilliant especially the climate marches it yeah. was making me think i mean because i don't know if people were on the demonstrations on friday and when we had a contingent from the museum who went in our lunch break to join the, the climate strike, and it was just amazing to see so many school students who actually, it would yeah. have been their first demonstration and how excited they were. But also the creativity you saw yeah. on the day was like amazing, really. So those homemade placards that yeah. everyone, all the school students were making, and that was making me think a bit about, I mean, the changes. So I was going to talk a bit about our banners in our collection, but yeah, please those do. kind of the kind of homemade placards it's very that kind of DIY kind of culture of doing it yourself and so many like witty and creative placards being made by school children that's kind of connecting to that Instagram culture as well it's kind of some people say the internet's kind of it's not obviously the internet isn't enough for building demonstrations yeah. or building movements but actually there sometimes can be a link between yeah. and with your so you've got your protest lab mm. so if people haven't seen oh, already yeah. you've got lots of big banners, you've got small stuff. Yeah. One of my chapters in the book is called Compete with Beauty, mm -hmm. which there's a, a Canadian designer who says, don't, con you know, if you're someone's given you hatred don't compete with more hatred of someone's talking about economics don't compete with more of that compete with beauty and the power of beauty and I, what I'd love to know from you within the archive you've got here but also what's on display is have you got any little anecdotes or stories of the really beautiful, delicate stuff. I mean, I saw mm. on, on Instagram just this week the Peter Lou embroidery has yeah. been shared hundreds of times, yeah. if not more. Have you got a few examples yeah. of how they've competed with beauty and got the power of the protest yeah. through their aesthetics? Yeah, I mean, we've got over 500 banners in our collection and we sort of change them every year to show off some of the different ones. I mean, my favourite banner at the moment on show is the one in the Peter Lou exhibition and it's the Skelmanthorpe banner. And it was made after the Peterloo massacre in Skelmanthorpe to remember the dead. Um, but it was kind of um, made by different people. So the conservators think it was kind of sewn by different people, um, not by professional banner makers at all, by kind of grassroots people making, remembering the, the dead. But it's just a beautiful, I'd, I'd recommend going to look at that banner because for me it's a, such a beautiful and poignant banner. And it also shows the overlaps between movements as well. So this was 
a democracy movement, so it was made to remember those who, who sacrificed their lives at Peterloo, but it also has an image of a, a slave, and it says, am I not a man and a brother? So kind of drawing from that biblical language. And these would have been the big movements at the time, that anti, I mean, the democracy movement, but also the anti-slavery movement, and you see them kind of um, coming together in that, in that banner. It's just, I mean, I love that banner. And also we know quite a lot about that banner, because in the 1920s, um, in Skelmanthorpe, a group of people made a story about that banner in the voice of that, the Skelmanthorpe banner. So the first voice person is the banner. <laughs> and it talks about it being a, it, it's, it made in very dangerous circumstances. So they have to, the banner is kept underground in a big hole in Skelmanthorpe. And every time it's brought, up, they, brought out, they have to dig a hole to bring it out again. Um, and, we, and so it, the, the, the story of the flag is kind of talks about when it's been used. And so those kind of histories of banners and that craft that's gone into it and how it's continued to keep movements going, I find pretty inspiring. But yeah, go and check out that banner if you haven't seen it at the end because it's it, for me it's just such a beautiful kind of expression of democracy and that anti-slavery movement coming together in Britain yeah I mean I love it I mean but we've got a huge amount of different banners and so a lot of our stuff at the moment is around contemporary collecting so if people have their own banners or placards feel, feel free to kind of come to our protest lab that Sarah mentioned where we have drop-off days where we're really encouraging people to to bring in their own kind of crafts and banners and placards and kind of and use the space and um, um, to kind of talk about protest today really um, so we've collected quite a lot of different placards from the from the demonstration from this the climate strike on Friday um, and some I think then every time they get more and more imaginative um, it's almost like a bit of a competition from the school students of who can get the best placards and definitely that link it does seem to really be almost made for an Instagram kind of view so we had the kind of going viral of those placards it's a bit of a competition now so yeah feel free to look through our protest lab and look at some of those kind of contemporary um, forms of, of protest that we collect. Um, I guess thinking through aesthetics, I mean, for, I guess aesthetics are quite important for the kind of creativist collective. And I want, could you talk a bit about how, how you use aesthetics within, within your kind of movement? Yeah, I mean, we were doing the workshop today and I heard one of our craftivist volunteers say, oh my word, she's thought through all of the detail. And I yep. was like, mm-hmm, I think through everything. <laughs> Maybe overthink through everything. Yeah, I mean, this was one of the gaps I felt that the activism toolkit was was lacking mm -hmm. of you know again we think here's an injustice i'm really angry about it as we should be i'm really sad about it so we need to get attention about it straight away so i'll do black and red you know red alerts people we know again through neuroscience through artists and through psychologists talking about red is a alert color that um as, as animals we look at straight away so in the short term it makes sense we needed something red but red is also a very scary colour it, it, because it is an alert, so it puts you on high alert. And that, again, means you can't think properly and it can put people off as well. So I loved looking as part of the, the book. I looked through the research of how colour can be powerful for people. So we use lots of hopeful, warm, warm yellows because they're hopeful colours. Greens is an active colour, but it's green is serene. It's a bit calmer. Um, I definitely use incorporate aesthetics in my craftivism to make it stronger and in my activism as well it's not craft related but with craftivism yeah i think through all of the, the detail and i read a lot about it so your tablecloth today we've got a lovely warm turquoise and we've got flowers on the tablecloth to talk about flourishing and to focus on the beauty in the world and how we can make more beauty you've got flowers actual flowers on the tables which all of our workshops do because there is an amazing study done at harvard about how if you have the same meeting in an office and in one meeting you have um, fruit and plants or one or the other and in another meeting you just have you know papers and a, a suitcase the meeting results are very different so the one with plants and food or anything natural in the space naturally taps people taps into people's intrinsic values more than their extrinsic values so intrinsic is more societal more selfless more community focused and focused on helping the planet whereas the other is very individualistic so 
in some way, you know, I try and make sure it's not manipulative, but it's definitely trying to um, help create a space that's about societal benefits and contributing to society. Mm -hmm. We have um, grapes often on our tables to show a sense of communal stitching and people sharing food. We always have instrumental music on, so that calms people. Um, other senses, so not just aesthetic, but also we have lavender spray often in the rooms to create a calm environment and engage people's emotions. But the aesthetics are, are vital, whether it's our workshops or our projects. And one um, example that I think shows it quite well, all of our projects are very different because they have different objectives, so they have different strategies. And one of them is these paper scrolls we make, which is to support fashion revolution, and they're mini fashion statements. And it's you shop drop them, which is the opposite of shoplifting. So you drop a little scroll that you've handwritten in your neatest handwriting. And we have three messages to pick from that are well crafted messages. But so much of the power was in the fact that we used watercolor paper. So it was textured. It wasn't white. It was cream. So it wasn't clinical. The ribbon that you tie your mini fashion statements in a turquoise purple or mauve because they're seen as luxury colors. So they're seen as valuable. Than rather than if it was with string and even just we encourage people to use gel pens or fountain pens so you mm. use ink so it seems valuable and beautiful and we get people to write in cursive not in capital spiky letters with exclamation marks but very beautiful personal handwriting and all of those elements meant that it was attractive, it was engaging, it was intriguing for people who found their scrolls. But also it meant that we could take beautiful images with my friend Chez over here, who's here. We made some lovely images that we knew would be worthy in fashion magazines and in um, fashion blogs and in creative outlets who do love aesthetics. And without those beautiful images, as well as the positive words that we had, we wouldn't have got covered in those areas that we wanted everyone who loved fashion to feel part of the movement. And I got an email back from a journalist thanking me for, for the project. And she said it was the first time she had the confidence to go up to her editor and say, this is about making the fashion industry as beautiful as the clothes and trying to change some of the um, the problems in the fashion industry. But it was written in a positive way and most of all we had these beautiful images that we could share. And she said it was the first time she could show it to her editor and say this is something we could cover because it wasn't naming and shaming brands. It wasn't saying if you love fashion you're awful. It wasn't judgmental. And it was something that she knew would attract their readers mm -hmm. and we got on the home page of the BBC News website which is one of the biggest websites in the world as well as double page spreads in newspapers um, and without those aesthetics yeah. we wouldn't have we wouldn't have got that. And hopefully you can see today, everything's very Instagrammable, which means we often reach out to audiences because of the aesthetics. People love our little stalk scissors, the little bird scissors. Um, and I think having those details makes it feel more special, more valuable, mm -hmm. reminds us of the beauty in the world. It reminds me a bit of, um, I mean, the suffragettes were, for them, the aesthetics were so important. They were for so movement. brand yeah. focused, and which the was colors, amazing. The way you talk about colours really reminded me of kind of their specific colours that they used. That means that the banners that they used, they, they kind of are so aware of kind of their audience and, and using aesthetics for, for the movement. So there's often... And, and yeah. I remember reading about how they said to women, please dress smart, wear your beautiful sashes, because the more elegant you look, the more startling it is for media, for the men in your life who are saying, you know, these are strong, intelligent women. They're not, you know, just go out and, and scream at people. It had to be very, like, um, yeah, on brand. Um, and even their badge, I mean, they were, I feel like they were brand leaders before the word brand existed. Yeah. I learned a huge amount from their aesthetics. Yeah, mm. yeah, definitely. Oh, that was really interesting just to think about those kind of links. I mean, I've just been reading your book. It's really interesting, um, to, and particularly thinking through your kind of chapter title, some of the kind of chapters around kind of slow activism, graceful activism, quiet activism, intriguing activism. So lots to kind of think about in, in those chapters. I mean, what do you mean by intimate activism? That was kind of a new concept for me, I guess. Yeah, I get a lot of people saying quiet activism, slow activism, what the <laughs> hell are you talking about? <laughs> and that attracts people in as well to yeah. be curious. Um, again, for me, I'm always looking at, like I am an activist and I believe in activism and 
most of my activism isn't in my personal life isn't craftivism it's quiet conversations with people at bus stops that have said something xenophobic or it's trying to encourage people to change their habits or I have lots of very boring secret meetings with um, power holders that doesn't involve craft and um, that are just as important as the craft but I felt like in the activism toolkit we need all these other forms but there was it felt very us against them so a lot of our language is about you should be doing this or we demand this from you um, and for anyone who's a decision maker you've got a lot of responsibility which is why we're targeting you <laughs> but it means that you've probably got a lot of demands on you as well and you're vying for people's attention and we all know that the more stressed we feel the more we sort of back away and close off just so that we can survive and not burn out or not collapse in a pile of stress and tears and I felt like there was really not much intimacy in terms of trying to engage those power holders it was very we're telling you what to do which if you if you've risen up to a CEO position um, and you've got all these different skills and suddenly you've got an activist saying you should be doing this I think if I was them, I'd probably, you know, get on my high horse a bit and say, you have no idea, I've been doing this for years, it's easy for you to tell me what to do, but you don't know how hard it is. So that intimacy for me, so we know intimacy means intimacy with human beings, so a, con a human connection, intimacy in terms of environments, so does it feel like a safe space to discuss stuff, and also intimacy in terms of personal engagement with different issues. So. If the craftivism itself helps you be intimate with your thoughts of what am I stitching, what am I writing, do I believe in it, how am I going to use this? I felt like the process really helped. But so much of the way activism engages with power holders was very transactional and very... Um, it wasn't intimate, it was treating people as you're the enemy or um, demonizing them or just seeing them as a politician and not a human. And I knew, from because I love to make gifts for people at Christmas and birthdays, and it's such an intimate act because you make something for that person. You give it to them, quite embarrassed normally saying there's a few mistakes, but it shows that you really care about them and you've thought about them. And I thought we should be doing this with politicians and board members. Um, so we make handkerchiefs. So you mentioned handkerchiefs before, Sharon. Um, we make handkerchiefs for power holders saying don't blow it, use your power for good. We know you've got a really difficult job and a really impressive job. And the don't blow it is a bit of a, like a humorous don't blow it rather than too aggressive. And we hand stitch them with a message on saying it's um, dear that person. And then we end it with yours in hope with your name. And if it's for your MP, it's with your postcode on so they know you're a constituent. And it's very small, so it's not, on a big row like this saying, I've made you this handkerchief to say don't blow it. It's very intimate. Often we don't share it on social media. It'd be quite quiet, quite private. And we normally hand deliver it to them or send it in the post. So if it was for your MP, you would ask to meet them to say I've given you a gift. Um, and I gave one to my MP who kept ignoring all of my petitions saying, this is a waste of your time sending these petitions. So I made her a gift saying, don't blow it, use your power for good, but this is a gift to encourage you in your role. Maybe keep your hanky in your pocket or your desk or somewhere as an encouragement. And because I gave her this gift, it was very intimate because I was embarrassed by it because it wasn't perfect, as most people who make stuff are. And I handed it over to her and it was a little bit, you know, coy about it and said, oh, Jane, I've made you this present to encourage you in your role. And she went from being very closed off and quite nervous because I was this activist sending her petitions to looking at the back of her hanky realizing it wasn't perfect um, and but so it took me hours and she suddenly her whole body changed from being quite stern to like a bit in shock because it was a weird gift to get and then quite open I said why did you become an MP and she told me her motives she said she used to work for John Lewis so I said oh aren't cooperatives brilliant Jane let's support more businesses to be cooperatives and because I'd gave her this very it was just between me and her and her staff member in the room I didn't say can we have a photo with you with this gift because then it's not a real gift and it created uh, it was a catalyst for us to be critical friends rather than aggressive enemies. It was respectful. It was about, it was humble. It was about her and not me. 
And it taught me a lot about if you hand make something for someone, quietly give it to them where it's about them and not about you. It can form this relationship that you can't get with other forms of activism often. And we've done it with board members where we've made them bespoke gifts, looking at Google and what colors they wear to incorporate that in the hankies to see whether they're really flamboyant and loud. And we have a quote from someone we think they'd respect who's similar to them or someone who's nervous. We might have a Rosa Parks quote or Eleanor Roosevelt quote. But by making these small, delicate, um, well thought out, unique gifts it's it does create this intimacy that you know we're thinking we're feeling people that think we're not thinking people that feel so when we feel these emotions emotions stay with us much longer than facts and figures and by hand delivering a bespoke gift it really does create this emotion in people that every time they remember you so we have a neuroscientist in residence at the craftivist collective dr charlotte ray at sussex university and she said which i hadn't read about and i read a lot on neuroscience and she said do you realize by giving a, your intimate gifts to power holders that fits in with how the brain works as well because by giving people a good surprise you create endorphins in them. So whenever they think of you or see you, their body literally says, that person gave me endorphins, I'm gonna speak to them. Whereas if you think of a lot of our activism surprises, it's throwing milkshakes at people, it's screaming at them with megaphones, it's quick responses, and that gives people a bad surprise. So whenever they think of you or other activists, again, then their brain physically rewires to say, I can't speak to these people, they're gonna attack me. So the intimacy totally fits with neuroscience without me realizing, but now I do, and you all know we should do more intimate activism. Oh, that's interesting, yeah. I mean, I'm gonna ask one, maybe one, one or two quick more questions to Sarah, but while we're doing that, if you've got any questions you want to ask, maybe give it a thought now, if you've got any points you wanna add, and then I'll come at the end and just, if anyone wants to put their hand up and have any questions or thoughts they want to add, that'd be really great to hear people's thoughts. Um, I guess, so you said first and foremost you're an activist and craft comes a kind of um, to support that, really. Um, and this event is around kind of dreams and dream makers. What, what, what's your dream for craftivism in the future and thinking through kind of those challenges in the future? Yeah, I give myself quite big dreams, mm -hmm. which is why I'm a bit of a workaholic. Um, I think for me, I mean, and this is what drives us, isn't it, is, is looking at what world do we want to be part of and how can we help move towards it. If we just focus on the problem, we can't think through the solutions and we do burn out much quicker and chronic stress literally has physical effects on us. So m for me, what gets me up in the morning isn't cross-stitching or back-stitching or um, paper craft. It's, for me, it's gentle protest. So when I talk about our approach as a craftivist collective to craftivism, because there's lots of approaches, it is that gentle protest. And throughout the, the last 10, 11 years, trying to hone my craft, because I'm, I am the most cynical about craftivism compared to lots of my friends and family where they're like, this is great. I'm like, well, it could be, but it could also be awful. So I'm always trying to hone it to be as good as it can be. And for me, the gentle protest is where I think the power is, not so much, um, yes, the aesthetics are important and everything else, but without that gentleness, not as in being passive or weak, but as being loving, being very thoughtful, being strategic and emotionally intelligent, but gently um, making a change is where I think craft can be of most use. So my dream is that everyone in the world knows that protest can be gentle and at sometimes it should be more gentle at sometimes we need to be loud i don't think we ever need to be hateful i think we can challenge situations and actions people take without label labeling them as bad we can label actions as bad but my dream is that everyone sees that activism can be gentle and that craftivism is one tool in the toolkit so when people think of activism they think of marches and petitions and placards and they also go and craftivism and this and that and that I quite like it as a norm of people seeing it as a useful thing and that's what really I mean I get loads of requests to do different projects with different organizations and it's still me and, and my um, colleague Leah one day a week and me full-time trying to do everything um, and with Heritage Open Day saying 
our theme is people power and we want to show other forms of people power it just felt like such a natural fit and I get so many people I mean today we've had people from Scotland come over there we've had people from Blackpool from Lancaster Caster from I'm gonna miss mix yeah. all the names. <laughs> so all loads <laughs> of places who've said I really want to experience gentle protest and mm -hmm. this craftivism and I've heard about it um, and I want to try and join that movement mm -hmm. um, who might not I mean some people I've spoke to say I can't go on that march or I can't go on this but I could do that and I think my dream is that people see that activism's for everyone. We all have different skills and strengths, yeah. but we're all needed. So it's not just this box to fit in. Um, and that's what I hope the, the whole Heritage Open Days week where we've had events across the country and having this video we'll have on YouTube for people to watch all over the world will we'll help people see themselves as gentle protesters. That's so just just yeah. a small dream. Yeah, that's sharing. really inspiring. Yeah, I find. I mean, I'm. Yeah, I find that really inspiring. And this idea of kind of different forms of protest. I mean, me personally, I I did like it when Tommy Robinson was milkshaked as well. <laughs> I think that there are different forms of protest that can work at different points, and I wasn't at all upset that a fascist standing to be our MEP um, was milkshaked. I thought it kind of mobilised in different ways a movement. Yeah, completely. Um, yeah. And I think we need, especially for media, we need some. We need these big images. Yeah. We need these actions I do worry though when we shame people that if anything it creates more of a division like he's not really he might just be we we know again from a lot of studies in America more on this about how if you challenge people who disagree with you it actually makes them believe their own view more so you have to do it in a gentle way but I do think an action, a visible action needed to be done to mm -hmm. say we do not agree with that person, mm -hmm. but it could have been something else that just says we are not with him. Mm -hmm. So yeah, no, I yeah. see what you mean, and definitely there were lots of different kind of because actually he he got a terrible vote in the end, and there yeah. was lots of different people doing different forms of kind of resistance to him to make sure he didn't represent the northwest at all. So I, I like that idea of different ways of kind of getting involved in the movement. Definitely, yeah. Would you? So would you like to read your epilogue of your book? Yeah, I feel like it's a cheat. It's reading the last pages of the book, but hopefully it won't spoil anything for yeah. <laughs> um, and then it has other bits in it, but. So it, it's, it starts with a quote from my favourite activist in the world, Martin Luther King, from his book called Strength to Love. And the quote is, the saving of our, of our world will come not through the complacent adjustment of the conforming majority, but through the creative maladjustment of the non-conforming minority. Human salvation lies in the hands of the creatively maladjusted which I think is a great quote. Um, it says, preached by Martin Luther King in his sermon, Transformed Nonconformist. To be a craftivist is not just to be someone who likes craft. It's to be someone who hones their craft to question injustice, encourage peace, and show ways to, ch to achieve a better world for everybody involved. The test of whether we truly want a better world is in the doing through action. So, are you ready to stretch out your hands and open up your, your craftivism toolbox? In the craftivism toolbox, you will find scissors to shape the future into a more harmonious world, thread to weave intimacy through protest where there is currently enmity, a needle to stitch love and kindness through structures that are lacking, a seam stripper to cut through the knots, tangles and seams that hold systems of oppression in place. A pattern to follow with courage, care and compassion where a robust plan of action is needed. So, craftivists, let's use craftivism as a form of gentle protest. Let's use our craftivism to practice what we preach, creating a world with beauty, kindness and fairness. Let's use craftivism as a way to stand up against injustice for the introverts as well as for the extroverts, for the crafters as well as the banner wavers, for the reflective amongst us as well as those who just want to dive straight in. Let's all pick up our tools and be effective change makers. Thank you very much.
knew it was coming to Manchester, was absolutely had to be involved. It was a very good experience. My dream is I want to see the world like peaceful and happy and calm. I've enjoyed meeting the lovely ladies that I've had on my table, they've been really good. And just seeing the different things that people care about as well, it's really encouraging to see that um, it's not just you who care about certain things as well. And then also listening to people who have different things that I've never thought about. So.